um, thanks for, for the um, for the summary uh, of the dissertation. And uh, I'll just say from the start, from being out of the field of, of your field, pretty far out of the field of your field, um, I found the dissertation an really enjoyable read. In such that I was able to uh, see the significance of it and also s follow along um, some of the concepts that you pulled out. So that was that was uh, surprising for me, just feeling like I would be pretty far removed from it. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions I had coming into the dissertation uh, defense was. Your methodology and the process. Mm -hmm. um, I understood what you were doing conceptually in your dissertation, but I didn't really get an idea of the process of what you actually did. Right. Um, <clears throat> so what you did in this presentation was was very helpful to help you understand how you actually did what you did, which I think is an important piece in people reading your research to know to know that process. Uh, the blunt, the Blended blender method. I've heard of narrative analysis. I've heard of Wolcott card sort method, which is more what you did. Um, but but just the idea of being able to describe that fully, which uh, you were able to do in the defense, and that, that was helpful to me. So I'm going to ask some questions that I think might be, uh, in the time that I have, might um, be more speculative than anything. I have a hunch, and maybe you can help me with this, mm -hmm. that people from different cultures view mathematical reasoning maybe differently than the culture of people who published in this journal. Do you have any ideas about that? I mean, oh, this is huge. Oh, most definitely. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the, the people I'm doing meta-analysis of are uh, mathematics education researchers, and a couple of straight up mathematicians like Davinsky. Um, Obviously, they, what they think mathematical thinking is very different than what an average parent would think. And again, I would point out though that not all of the researchers in this are from the United States. There's, there's lots from you know Western Europe, a couple of Asian ones. But so, in that respect, the, the researchers are very well represented across cultures. But you are correct that when people use phrases like mathematics and mathematical thinking, they're only talking about small parts. In fact. Mathematics kind of means two things. It means both the product, the, the facts and figures, and that's what the, the average Joe on the street would mean. Mathematics, oh, Y equals MX is big, that's mathematics. And then there's sort of mathematicians, the process, how do you get the mathematics, which is kind of what I'm talking about here, the process. And then there's also the level of, of, of what do people value, and that was the, the community. Mm -hmm. And different communities very much have different ones. One of the one researchers were there, we actually had two articles, uh, Jin Fa Kai, I believe, and he did cross-cultural analysis of the United States versus China. And he's looking at not necessarily what people think mathematical thinking is, but how people teach it. Mm -hmm. right? And he talked about that um, Chinese students do better overall, but when it comes to kind of these open-ended, interpret a situation scenarios, they don't do as well. And the Americans do better. And as, as he started talking about what was different between the two groups, it became apparent that what the Chinese kind of value or believe in that kind of thing is sort of the absorb, calculate, and produce. Whereas Americans, if we're, again, I'm being, we're talking constructive as best practice here, we're not talking kind of necessarily every classroom, but our best classrooms, what it's about is digesting a situation, extracting the mathematics from it, and then being able to make a prediction or analysis. And those are both in, right. in the model, but they're different parts. So the, Ch the Chinese group was kind of this top right corner, whereas the American group of students was sort of this bottom group. And so different cultures definitely do enact different pieces of it mm -hmm. and value different pieces of it. But ultimately, everyone does all of it. Uh, thanks for your answer. That makes my question, you give a nice long answer, makes my question seem like a important questions. <laughs> Appreciate it. It raises the level of what I have to ask. Um, and I don't know the history of mathematics and mathematic reasoning, 
but one of the things I suspect about your study is it's a snapshot of what happened in the last 10 years. If you were to do this in another decade, mm -hmm. a previous decade, this historic decade, mm -hmm. and you can pick it if, if, and again, this is another speculation question, how might you think you, what kind of different responses might you get? Well, sure, I, and I think the qualitative evolution in research makes a huge difference. Obviously, I'm not looking at people here, yeah. I'm looking at research. And so prior to the qualitative shift in the 70s and 80s, depending on you know, where you started, the, the community part, that inclusion part, we could never have spoken of it, it would have been taboo. That being said, um, one of the people I looked at trying to get a handle on the concept of mathematical thinking before I even started my research was Schoenfeld. And Schoenfeld used a lot of these same, same words, like mathematization and disposition. It wasn't, it was, again, sort of out there, just words floating, they didn't mean anything to anybody but him. But he can't, you know, so that was 1991. So that was even before any of my analysis. And so he was looking back into the 80s and having similar elements. But who went much further back than that, you're right. Pieces, pieces of that would drop off. And I, I, I imagine 30 or 40 years from now when we have our next research revolution and come up with a new way to research things, we'll get one, more, one or more two nodes in there on top. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Mathematics is a discipline or math education is a discipline? That's a very good question. Um, let's do both. Okay. <laughs> well, with, with mathematics as a discipline, we can really start pairing off on left and right and just get rid of people. We can really <laughs> almost narrow it. No, seriously, we can almost narrow it down to people who have PhDs in mathematics. In fact, I had more than one article who say, you know, I was looking at master's students in mathematics and they just didn't have it. They weren't there. They were starting to, they were kind of getting into it, but they were in the process of getting the PhD. And, and I had more than one person say, you know, in terms of the mathematics that we're knowing and doing on the cutting edge today, it's all PhDs. The average person doesn't belong. That kind of bothers me a little bit because, hey, astronomy, people make new discoveries in astronomy in their backyards. People make new discoveries. Uh, in, in uh, energy in, in their science class in high school. And so, um, so mathematics is a discipline and, you know, you don't really only looking at pe people with like master's degrees and PhDs in mathematics, unfortunately, at least according to the researchers, not for me. But if we get into this broader discussion of what is mathematics, not just as this sort of abstract discipline, but as a piece that is productive for society, you know, now we're getting kind of into what's mathematics education and disciplines. Almost everyone is, is a mathematical thinker in, in some way and influences other people's thoughts. And in fact, you might really say that there isn't just one mathematical community because, you know, you talk about and do mathematics one way when your mom says, do your homework, then when your teacher says, do this in the class, mm -hmm. and or or from your seventh grade teacher to your eighth grade teacher, and so it becomes that there isn't necessarily a coherent mathematics education 
community, and that's part of the problem. And that was sort of the basis of the beginning. There is no paradigm from which we can start to develop these borders. And so, um, ideally, um, I would say it would be, it could be anyone, but it isn't necessarily. It's anyone who contributes back. And so, I think the piece that really makes you a member of the community is contributing something back. Now, it can vary what you think contribution means. Again, as I said, in China, contribution simply means producing the correct answer. And so, you know, any, any a straight A math student is a member of the mathematical community there. But here, let's, we value different things. Mm -hmm. um, so is that something that you think you might explore further, sort of flesh it out, now going beyond the pages of this journal? Oh. More? oh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and the social aspects, the disposition of the community mm -hmm. were the least well documented in, in the research. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, they're much younger pieces of research than the, the sort of the everyday experience and, and the mathematical world and, and misconceptions and things like that. Um, you know, there are lots of great ideas about what does a mathematical thinker believe, and and uh, I talk about that in the so, But there's no there's no form, like minimum list. There's no necessary and sufficient conditions. This makes you or without these you are not. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, again, it depends on who you ask. And so the question becomes, who's in, in terms of mathematics education, who gets to decide? Is it the policymakers? Because that's who's making decisions right now. And I, let me tell you what, their, their definition of mathematical thinking is the top and maybe a little bit of the bottom. Mm -hmm. Right? And so we want, definitely want math and researchers in there. And that adds on the sides. So it's really, I guess, ideally it's just whoever will give something back. Some tiny itsy bitsy piece of new knowledge would make the formal ideal. That's where we would round out the model more. And math educators are in a good position to mm -hmm. problematize right. community, think more about the link between the mathematical world and everyday experience, and then to talk to think more about the students' sense making and the dispositional piece. Right. Um, the dispositional piece um, seems new to me. I mean, did you find evidence of it in Schoenfield that he attained uh -huh. to it? Schoen Schoenfield actually uses the word disposition, oddly enough. And which I did not realize until I went because he's outside of the the meta-analysis. It wasn't until I went back and kind of was getting ready for the test, like, oh, he actually uses that word right out. Other people do too, but... So it's, it's not a new one, a d idea in itself, but it is younger than some of the other ideas that are in this model. And so, can I ask you, oh. I haven't read Schoenfeld, so you have free reign here, sure. but what, can you compare, sure. um, just off the cuff, you get what you learned about mathematical disposition with what he wrote about it uh, some, what, 20 years before? Uh, 19, yeah, 1991, 92, so, so um, that's Alan Schoenfeld. Uh, I think he graduated from Stanford? That's where he's at. No, oh. he's, yeah, he's at uh, Berkeley, right? Yeah. Um, he has four big pieces in mathematical thinking, 85, 92, 94, and 2011. The first three are basically rehashes of the same thing over and over again. Um, and then the 2011 one, which came out just not that long ago, I mean, while I was working on this, um, is a little bit different. The 1985 version said, I, we just need a way to talk about it. We just we need somewhere, things we think are important about mathematical thinking from which we can start research. So in 1985, there was basically nothing. And he was just saying, we need to start. And these are the things. Content knowledge, uh, problem solving, human strategies, metacognition, and beliefs. So even in 1985, he had this concept. Although, again, he was probably the youngest of them. Metacognition, which was more like sense making in mind. Uh, problem solving strategies, which again, th and that's the thing, right? Except for the beliefs, those top three parts are basically all sense making. Well, the content knowledge could be up in, in the mathematical. And so it's, it's a very small piece of the model, but again, this is 1985 when we were just coming up with this concept of mathematical thinking. Um, in 19, uh, 1992, um, which was in the first NCTM handbook, which is like one of the first big compilations of important math and research, he uses some of these exact words disposition, community, intuitions. And he actually says it's overdue for the field to undertake some form of consensus. So in 1992, there was always some sense that, hey guys, let's come together. You know? And in 1994, he, he used, again, some more words, mathematization, abstraction, sense making. Still saying, hey, come on, let's get together. Let's, let's try using some of these words. Um, the problem being is that, uh, the, and these are his words in the 2011 book, it provided a framework, a way of looking but not a way of interpreting or predicting. It's not a theory. And that's what he felt was missing. And so it's, it's kind of funny that he and I were both working on this task, which I think gives my dissertation some legitimacy. 
if this big name in, in mathematical thing was like, it's not done yet. It's not there. We don't have a definition. Um, and this is, this is what he now says. This is his 2001 version. But um, this is sort of this linear product. So this is sort of like in any given instance, you kind of have this process. And there's some cyclical bits in it. But it's, again, it's just mostly focusing on that sense making aspect. And so while he says, yes, there is this community, and yes, there is this disposition, and that he's, he doesn't sort of point out how we connect. So he's really saying, he's got a lot of great stuff about sense making, um, which I'll probably use in the future, but the other pieces and how they kind of interact with each other, he didn't have quite as much of. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can see a, a wonderful parallel between what you um, are doing, especially in your, in your walkthrough, but particularly in your last chapter, and Schoenfeld's latest work, um, and that is that your, what your model does is it thinks through the structure of a discipline, really any discipline, right? Any discipline. Potentially. Fall under, yeah, potentially. Can fall under, under this. So you don't have to think so hard about what's math, what's math. Because that question is sort of going to be honest for you at any given moment by this mathematical community, right? So it's already a fungible. Right, and he actually, uh, I, I stuck, um, very dutifully to only talk about mathematical thinking, but he kind of, from this, from his theory says, mathematics is the science of patterns. It's pattern recognition, basically, formally. And that's, and he, he kind of speculates that our early thoughts about, like, if you just practice math, you get smarter in general. Well, that's because the, the way we test intelligence, the way we test being a smart person is pattern recognition. You know, all those IQ tests, there's elements, uh, the fluid intelligence is pattern recognition and how you process. And so, there is a way, in, if, if you wanted to define mathematics as getting away from all the numbers and simply saying it's the study of patterns and the un, you know, using patterns to predict things, it is sort of a general, we could talk about mathematics as a general intelligence if we wanted to in that way. And then yes, everything is mathematics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll save it for the next round. Yes, because it doesn't matter which community you're a member of, it's just that there is a community. That's that post epistemological kind of thing all over again. There is a community, there might be multiple communities, but there is at least one. But if we're talking about simply a math classroom, especially a very traditional classroom, really the mathematical thinker is the teacher. Because it's sort of a, the bucket model, I will take the mathematical knowledge from my head and put it into you. So it's all normalization and no contribution or very minimally contribution is given the correct answer like it is in China. Okay. Can you imagine a mathematical classroom where there would be then no mathematical thinkers? I mean... Yes. Mm -hmm. Study island? Right, okay. Well, but, but, I'm, but I'm wondering... So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to imagine what is not mathematical thinking? If any community can be a mathematical community, right. is this... Is your model so all-encompassing that it almost becomes well, well, no, and that, that is one of the dangers, and which is why I had that, is everything mathematics yeah. kind of. Um, as I was saying to Dr. Levison before, right now, anyone is a mathematical thinker, ideally anyone who is intentionally a mathematical thinker, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Right, and so right, right now the borders are porous. We want, we want them to be a very low threshold to get in, because we want you know, mathematics for all, according to the NCTM. Um, but I think we want to we get away from communities that have only part of the, I want to put the hands up <laughs> the picture, right? That only have parts of the things. And, and what we really have in many math classrooms is mathematical world sense making, mathematical world sense making. And it's just this tiny little loop. And that's, that's a piece of mathematical thing, but 
So I think in almost any scenario you can get some element of mathematical thinking because human beings have this sort of quantitative knowledge. And you know, even even in the worst case scenario, we, I know we've seen we've seen those tribes deep in the jungles of Brazil that don't have number words, but they do have singular and plural. We we we, we do recognize as a species quantity, even if it's purely at a, a subitizing kind of biological level of less and more. Um, but so are you so you. So you have to kind of get all of it for it to be mathematical thinking functionally. And a lot of the pieces in my dissertation I talk, I talk about, without this other piece, the piece I'm talking about right now, just goes haywire, especially generalization. People generalize like crazy, and there's a ton of literature about misconceptions, which is generalization gone wild. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then, so then this other question that I have is, is mathematical And this can be my own read of it as a teacher educator. I see a lot about learning, a lot about teaching. And the way you talk about it probably from given your background. So is is it the same as is it synonymous? Can we not take the learning of math out of this mathematical thinking? Or is that do you see those things as being integrally related? Perhaps I'm reading too much into your model? Well How do you speak to that? So you if you've got to be learning something if you can be in learning, so, but you're right, you put science up there and then maybe we're talking about scientific thinking, we talk about facts from the US history, maybe we're talking about historical thinking, and that's future research, but you say, you know, this is about learning math, but again, what do you mean by math? You mean math the product or math the process? And, and right now is math the product. And with that the case, justification falls apart into, I mean, you just lose so much of this model if you're only saying memorization. And in that case, you Memorization, you're almost kind of skipping sense making, which is why pre mathematized information is sort of that hype. Now, you're going to have to take something on faith from somebody else at some point. But, I mean, I don't really feel like you're doing mathematical thinking if it's all just memorize, memorize, memorize. Here's this existing document, memorize all of it. That's not mathematical thinking. So, but is thinking the same as learning? I guess it's what I'm getting. getting. <coughs> this model is sort of an information processing model. Um, which makes it different than a lot of other models that exist, which were developmental models. They're saying you, you start working like this, and then you get, and then you acquire this piece, and then you acquire this. The idea here is that this is all of this is hardwired into the brain, and as you as you use these pieces, the, the arrows get bigger and thicker, and you get better, and they get faster, more automatic. And so the process, so just living, you're going to be doing these pieces but only through active instruction, you know, or through you know, life circumstances that require you to do proofs for some reason, are you going to get justification in a meaningful adult sense? And so I think life in that respect is, is mathematical thinking, but to, to get a fully realized where all of the pieces work at least most of the time, that's learning, you know what I mean? Like that's deliberately practicing a particular piece that's already hardwired to your brain. So to me, I was thinking, is this talking about, do you always start here with mathematical thinking, or do you, is that your starting point for learning math? That, or both, or that, that comes back, almost everyone in this is Piagetian. I mean, obviously there's Vygotskians as well, and, and Vygotskians in there as well, but almost everyone says, hmm, Piaget. And Piaget uh, comes from, his, gives all credit to his work to uh, Immanuel Kant, who did the critique of pure reason. And in the critique of pure reason, Kant says, let's talk about this thing, God, because we've been talking about God for a long time in philosophy. And he says, well, we define God as this, this thing that's outside of space, outside of time. Well, what's then what the word God mean? And ultimately, you know, when we're talking about God, well, we, we imagine that, that old guy with the beard, a picture we've seen, or, or, an, or an image, or a passage from the Bible. And it's, it's kind of like that. So the... By saying everything starts from everyday experience, that's uh, owning up to the Kantian tradition here, that humans do not come to know anything except through our five senses. Okay. Okay.
a breath. Doing good. Um, I'm glad you referenced the NCTM and, and their, their uh, premise that we teach mathematics to all students. And I was thinking about that in regard to your model here. Um, can everyone think mathematically? Uh, barring brain damage, this is, again, an information processing model. I'm saying this is how just the brain is kind of hardwired. Um, you know, much like we talked about short-term memory and long-term memory, th that's just sort of how the brain is. So, I would say anyone, barring physical reasons, biological reasons, can learn all of this. But, and this is a big but, uh, the, what makes it work, especially at a professional level, even for a physicist or an engineer, is automaticity and confidence. And it's Especially in mathematics, the disposition of I am a mathematical thinker, I can, I can do this, is lost very early. And once it's gone, it's so hard to get back. And, and you just can't make up those hours of practice that, you know, we always quote 10,000 hours to become an expert. Is that, it's sort of that, that idiom, right? And so the, they don't become really reliable processes without a lot of practice and the right conditions. So um, this model very much acknowledges that. In, with, without the right supports, without the right uh, social norms, you know, without the right opportunities of experience, we're not going to end up with a complete picture here, at least not in a functional way. Well, I, and here's my question about in, in the use of the model. Uh, if I ask that question to a variety of different groups of people, I'm yes. going to get yes and I'm going to get no from those different groups of people. How could you use your model yes. to explain to both of those groups, why the answer was yes and why the answer was no. Well, it, it, come, uh, it comes down to the, the piece that they care about. When people say, no, not everyone, well, I, I would agree that practically, no, not everyone is going to be a fully realized that matter. Could, could you explain to someone with that where, yes. where on the model well, might be problematic with regard to mathematical thinking? Almost. Almost uh, assuredly, it's in the social aspect, because a lot of what we know about memory is that you know whether you're Einstein or or a three-year-old kid, you can only pro you only hold like seven pieces of information here. You know the memory works basically the same way. Yes, you might have a slightly better memory or a slightly worse memory. It's not that cognitive act, act that that's the problem. It's what you're told to value, what you're told to pay attention to. And those, those come from social norms. And that goes back to the community question is, because if mom and dad say, you'll never need to know that, OK, and it's gone. And no, you know, because they tend to be the primary authority in their life for a long time, no amount of teachers saying, no, it really matters. No, you really have to pay attention. You're going to need this math in your own life. And I'm like, meh. And, and so <laughs> uh, and at the same point, you know, you know, what we said, you know, we noticed that you know the kids in the fourth, fifth grade, Nose dive. They've been doing great kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Something, there's something magical about fourth grade where kids start plummeting and they were well developmental, and that's when they start knowing the opinions of others. That's when they start realizing that you know it's not girlish to be a mathematical thinker. It's uh, you know it's nerdy to be a mathematical thinker. Or or they have or they finally hit that first level where they're not good at it. You know, so, so they, they, the arithmetic maybe they've been great, and then they this thing, fraction addition, comes along. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time they've ever struggled. And their disposition is such that you're only good at a thing if you get it right the first time. Right? So there's, and so there's kind of, I wish, I, I don't know how to connect it, but there's all these other communities. So there's like the family community, and then there's like, there's the, you know, intelligence disposition, what do you believe in? Like, so there's all these other pieces that kind of are floating around the outside that influence it, but it's almost always matters of, what you're told to do, as it were told is important, or shown, we can talk to him curriculum stuff a lot. <laughs> um, but it's also a matter of just like, I don't, I'm not confident, someone has shattered my ego, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that, I'm not gonna stretch my neck again. And so that's why I think, and so very quickly those become unsurmountable, at least in, the, in our current system. So, so ideally, practically everyone could be a mathematical thinker. But in the practical realities of day-to-day -day life, 
you would need the magic school bus to make everyone. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm just, I'm looking at this as a tool to work with various constituencies right. on that particular topic of whether or not people are capable and what are some of the issues that your model could flush out that people could actually attack either with research or practical um, issues that they could attack some of those issues to overcome sure. some of the some of the problems that you've stated. Mm -hmm. I, get, I, get, I get some sure, questions sure, sure, sure. about your model. Um, the whole model itself looks sort of regular, kind of a regular polygon, if you will, of sorts. And as well as the rectangles that you've used to depict the various nodes. Right. Um, all equal, at least they look pretty congruent to me uh, in size. So that would sort of, you know, when you're looking at someone's model, you're, you're sort of saying, well, they must be of equal importance, they must be of equal influence. But, but as I think one of the previous um, questioners asked early on, you, you made a reference to um, the uh, everyday experience being the launching. I don't get that from the model necessarily. There's no color differentiation, there's no size, no arrow indication. So elaborate for me, uh, for the rest of us, why this is the launching point and um, how, does, how does your model convey movement? I mean, you got arrows, there's a lot of depiction of movement there, but um, it's hard to tell whether there's a logical movement here, in, if in fact there is one. Sure. So like, this is the final, this is complete mathematical thinking, ideal, idealized. So uh, I totally admit that for a little kid, everyday experience is going to be this huge thing. And again, they're only boxes because that's, that's easy. So I, I agree that at different stages, different pieces are going to be huge compared to others. And especially if you talk about PhD and mathematician, PhD mathematician, everyday experience might get very small. But sort of this kind of idealized, not talking about any one age or profession, they're all relatively equal. And it could be oriented in any different way, but I, I have a 2D space to work with. Um, you know, if we wanted to make it a tetrahedron, we could do that. Um, so there's, but what matters here is not what is located where. Everyday experience is sort of first, again, as I said, developmentally. But once you've got kind of a, a critical mass of everyday experience, you can, you can get stuck up in that top loop and be happy for the rest of your life. And PhD mathematicians do all the time. They, you know, I've got, I've, let me just do five more proofs on this same basic concept and never go outside, never look at a ball and go, oh, parabolic motion, right? You know? And so at different phases for different people, these are going to be, and that's, that's a future line of research. What, do, what does mathematical thinking look for a PhD mathematician? And so maybe maybe the mathematical world is huge and everyday experience is small. And then an engineer, well, for an engineer, everyday experience is still going to be huge because they're, they're out there doing stuff. And so that's down the road. Right now, all I can say is that because I don't have enough data about specific groups at specific ages, they're all relatively equal. And it's, and it's only regular to make it pleasing to the eye. Okay, fine. Well, I'm, just, I'm not trying to read anything into it. I'm just trying to read what I see. Sure. And then the sense making, which I, I would agree tends to be the center uh, point. Um, you used a different shape. Is that again just for aesthetics? Yes. Okay. Uh, they can all be circles. They're they're nodes. They're they're point they're points in a, an ontological space. Okay. Although, can we talk about that? Yeah. Um, did I exceed my ten minutes? No, you have. Sorry. 30 seconds. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you my time. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I got more questions, but I, I can jump into. So go ahead. But it sort of Honest. goes from what you're saying, yeah. but I'm wondering about, um, it seemed significant to me that sense making was at the center. Yes. That for, no matter what the, the jumping off point for various people, it's, or even if you take Kanta as, as the center, right, right. As in your example, um, sense making is what make, uh, prompts us to make sense of everyday experience and connect it with the mathematical world or the mathematical community. So it's, it's, if you're, it's not so much that you're looking for the entry point, or rather, you are, and the entry point is sense-making. Does that sound? Uh, 
when you do sense making is when I would call it mathematical thinking. If I say to do this one thing is the minimum threshold for mathematical thinking, it's sense making. Because we walk around in the world all the time and you know I move stuff, but I don't necessarily ponder it mathematically. But it's there, you know, the mathematical constructs are there to be abstracted from, from the mathematical world. But I don't always do it. It's not until I start trying to process it, do the sense making, that I'm doing the so that was, that's sort of my criterion. But the places where you come in, yeah, are, are very different. I would say, especially if we're talking K-12 education, it's everyday experience. But does that answer your question? It, it's, it's central in that you're not doing mathematical thinking without it. You know, you can be a member of a community. You can go talk to mathematicians, and you're not doing mathematical thinking. It's not until you're, tr you're having a conversation about mathematics and trying to understand what's in your head and what's in my head and how they match. And that's sense making. Okay. Um, how would you explain, again, another construct that, that comes up quite frequently in the literature is this notion of school mathematics and school thinking about mathematics from that point of view. Mm -hmm. How would you use your model to explain that phenomenon? school mathematics. So what parts of mm -hmm. this get exemplified? What parts of it are missing? Sure, that's that's almost entirely the mathematical world of the mathematical community. A professional mathematician and a kid can have the exact same opinions and beliefs about what mathematics is about and themselves as mathematical thinkers, whether they're in eighth grade or if they're eight years old and just retiring. Right? What's different are the, the things that are valued. So the school the school math community <coughs> values different pieces than the professional mathematical community, much like the United States school system values different things than the Chinese school system. And additionally, different pieces are considered part of the mathematical world. So the mathematical world is, is sort of the, the collage of all the facts and figures and axioms, right? Well, if we're talking school mathematics, we're talking almost, almost universally Euclidean mathematics. We're, you know, we're talking Cartesian coordinates. Occasionally we do other things, but the things like spherical coordinates, toroidal spaces, those are meaningless to the school of mathematics. And so um, it's sort of a Venn diagram. Can we, can we pick on uh -huh. just one of those school mathematics topics? Um, let's just say um, systems of equations, sure. for example. Okay, that's a pretty typical concept there. I wouldn't be too surprised if mathematicians occasionally talked about that and that's thought right. about those. And I'm not saying that, that what what would be the difference in the discussion mm -hmm. between those two groups with regard to the things that you have depicted on here? That may be how to characterize the difference in the school mathematics. Sure. I would say that the school mathematics world is a subset of the mathematical world as a whole. And it's chosen rather deliberately, uh, originally on the, the Council of Ten a hundred years ago, but more and more based upon what's developmentally appropriate for with systems of equations. In school, we're, we're typically talking linear equations, maybe quadratic. Whereas a professional mathematician, you can have a system of uh, differential equations. Okay, sure, right? So the thing, the thing, so even though we're talking about the same concept of multiple equations working together and having points where they work together, the kinds of equations we talk about, uh, how many, you know, again, in, in high school, I don't, I don't remember doing more than three equations at a time. And a professional mathematician is perfectly happy to do 10 of them at a time, throw them in a maker mix, sure, why not? But, but Sean, the, the discussion that would go around, whether it was differential equations or linear equations or what have mm -hmm. you, the discussion, it seems like, in the school setting would be, okay, the bottom line is, here's the answer. Whereas, yes. I think in a different community, the bottom line is, I wonder if that applies to other groups of, of equations. And uh, so, so in light of your model here, right. the, and how those discussions get carried out, or you had mentioned values and where that's at on your on your chart here. I mean, is there a significantly different, um, like if we, if we attach lights mm -hmm. or colors to your your rectangles in the center, which ones might go off right. in in a, in a school setting versus? you know, a mathematician. Right, set. so the, the school setting, um, 
outside of the geometry class, and I'm talking the current educational system, not what we could potentially do constructively. Justification almost never goes off, except in geometry class. So we're talking systems equation, it's just, it do, do it, it works. You might even have them do some gauss stroganian reductions. Hey, it works, I don't care why. The mathematician is very much more concerned about why, that's the justification. So um, whereas mathematization goes on both the So just, justification almost never goes off in K-12. A, a little bit at the arithmetic level, you know, when we start talking about things like, um, you know, multiples of nine, the sum is always nine. We do occasionally talk a little bit about like why that works. We can talk about place values and, and base 10 math. And that happens a little bit sometimes, but almost never. Um, well, contribution I'm, almost never happens in the school. Although it could. Again, justification, all these things could, but as it stands now, they almost never happen in the current school. What about the, all the lip service we play to um, everyday experience, mm -hmm. real world problems, oh, put sure. that in quotes? Um, do we really have real world problems that we encounter in schools that we say we do? They are real world in that they are in a real world context like buses. But they are not real world in the sense that they require the student to abstract. Um, there's that really great TED talk about math class needs a makeover. And he talks about how we always give them the exact right amount of information. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of plug and chug. That's pre-mathematized information. That's not everybody experience at all. Everyday experience says, okay, let me give you a lot of data, and you have to pick the data that matters. Or, before we even talk about data, let's talk about the process. What, you know, what intuitions do you have? What do you think matters in talking about systems of equations, you know? You know? And the dispositions would be dim, too, if you're thinking of lighting the board, right? Mm -hmm. Think about how often was your capacity for aesthetic evaluation spot? In, in fact, it's almost negative, you know, it's, it's really in the K-12 scenario, the mathematical disposition prevents mathematical thinking because what gets in there are pathological beliefs, like I'm not a mathematical thinker, mathematics is done, you know, all these, they get in the way of mathematical thinking, and I think I talk a little bit about that in the dissertation, it really, you have to, so in that respect, the professional mathematics, they have a much healthier set of dispositions. learners and all people are being and members of multiple communities, essentially multiple cultures. And each culture gives rise to a set of dispositions. And, and I, I'm not sure if maybe I'm not understanding. You have your social cultural dimension here. And I like that you, that you talked about that. For me, mathematical dispositions may not be something that are individualistic. It's something that would, and it would not necessarily be set for an individual but something that they, one would negotiate in different cultures. You know, so for instance, I'm in math class, so I adopt a certain set of mathematical dispositions, where in my life I value other things. Um, and yet, to me, I don't see there being, at least within your model as it's kind of presented here, I don't see there being any communication between the two of those. The idea being that these are fill in the blank nodes. You're still doing mathematical thinking in science class, even though the members of the community are different or even though the, the pieces of knowledge that we care about. So, so we're talking about, in physics, we're talking about fixed vectors instead of the free vectors that we can talk about normally in calculus, right? So the, the piece, but the same structure, you're still processing these social values and you produce different sense based on the different norms that you inherit. And sometimes, you know, that happens all the time. You know, sometimes you learn something in, in science class and you try, assume it's going to work in the math class and it doesn't because the science class use has lots of assumptions built into it about the scenario, like no wind resistance. And, and so the, this model says you're doing mathematical thinking, whether you're in a math classroom or in a science classroom. All, the, all that's different is that you've got different members in the community, different elements of the mathematical world. Right? And so, yeah, I mean, so you're producing a different sense. But this, the underlying process is the, the hard wiring of the brain is the same in both cases. Okay, but, but so, so in your diagram here, and in your thinking of this problem, are math, what are mathematical dispositions? Are they their properties of an individual? Do, and do they vary 
they, they are properties of an individual, and they certainly could vary. I don't swear in front of my grandmother, right? The, my dispositions about swearing are very different when I'm hanging out with my friends and when I'm hanging out with my grandparents, much like a student's dispositions can be very, and, and even within the realm of mathematics class, my seventh grade math class and my eighth grade math classes, the teachers had completely different teaching styles. So the way I make sense of mathematics, all, all, I mean, it takes uh, hold of the same kinds of information, but the, ultimately what's in those pools of data is different, and so I come up with different pieces of sense. Yeah, I, and, so, and I can't tell you where, where I'm thinking here. So for instance, for me, like, again, I'm thinking of the world of science, but in the world of math, this may be, may be the case as well, where within the world of science, we value that knowledge may be tentative and subject to change, and, and so we, we're not holding on to some value for certainty, and yet a lot of individuals look at the world in terms of wanting to have everything to be certain, or, or not having, not valuing uncertainty, as we're saying, they kind of relish in that. But as an individual may practice within a science classroom, or even within a science community, and yet have very different dispositions toward knowledge in different contexts. But I don't see communication here between your mathematical dispositions box and your mathematical community. And maybe to someday you're going to draw all kinds of crazy arrows here. Okay, I, I think I understand what's going on. The disposition is you, in, inside of you. Sense making is sort of like the conscious you, whereas the disposition is more like the subconscious. These are just things that are part of my psyche and my schema that I don't necessarily activate. They're just that I am a mathematical figure, I'm not a mathematical figure. You, unless you outright ask a kid, they're not thinking that, but if you do, then they eventually have, they, they have an answer. Okay. Right, and, and so the idea, the reason why there's not a direct arrow from the disposition to the community is it is we're, now we're going to get into like lip crit and Derrida and Foucault. Like you, you, there is the thing the person says, and then you have to process those symbols in your brain, and then you go, oh, I believe that, or no, I don't, right? And so that's the sense making part. Is it, it doesn't come words from my mouth don't get to you, the person, except through your ears, and then Broca's area and Broca's more of these areas. Like so, there's that's the sense making part, and so that's why there's not a direct line from the disposition, which is sort of the internal world. And the mathematical community, the extra world. The sense making is from the gateway. It's your lips, it's your ears, it's the five senses. Everything is mediated by the sense making. Yes. Mm -hmm. I guess one, one question I have is a larger question again. Um, thinking that, um, is it possible that you're only capturing part of the elephant? Oh, for sure. Oh, because I'm doing a meta analysis. I can only make use of what data is available. And as I said, 20 or 30 years from now, when we come up with a new, a new kind of form of research, we, we really perfect mixed methods, people are going to start, or we, or we as a community start caring about different things, we're going to start producing research that we've never done before. Uh, or there's going to be a paradigm shift and we're going to redefine things. And five more boxes may show up. But given the 12 or 13 years in this particular journal, and I feel that this journal is fairly representative because even though they don't cite each other within the journal, they cite lots of other journals. Um, this is indicative of the state of the discussion today. Do you have any hunches about those five other boxes? Well, I, as I said, I, I totally acknowledge that there's connections to other communities. I don't know how to connect the this math, you know, the mathematical thinking to my family thinking, right? I don't. Especially if we're talking, you know, because they're not. Because they're, they're not. They're not in your journal. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, yes, yes. I know that what my parents think about mathematics influence what I think about mathematics. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I don't know how to build networks, and I don't know how, like, so there's there's lots. Of, I don't know how to put the pieces together. One, the big thing I want to know goes back to that that comic web comic is how does this piece fit in with all the others? Because as a math teacher, I don't understand why in seventh grade we teach physical science and mathematics separately. Because as a math teacher, when I want to teach the math, I do a physical science lesson. Like, let's roll marbles down ramps. Awesome. And, and so if it becomes really, they all have the same structure, just different facts and names, then the, the whole concept of classrooms without walls suddenly makes a whole lot more sense research base wise But we can't do that until we start having those discussions about interdisciplinarity, which we don't do right now. I mean, Starting to interdisciplinary research is kind of cool and new, but we're not there yet. Just want to tell the group that we've done follow through about 15, 20 minutes now. So, is there any? Yeah,
arrows could change, the, 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 not change, but I mean the crazy arrows you were talking about. So right now you have instruction from mathematical community for some reason down to everyday experience, right? Well, so the, the idea is everyday experience in the mathematical world are just sort of sets of data, whereas community and disposition are people, whether it's you or other people. And the community can, as a teacher, I can say you will do this activity. You will have this experience. I'm enforcing it, but I'm not directly influencing your sense making. And physics, the physics of a classroom and gravity aside, it doesn't influence back on the community, right? Except in that community is made up of individuals, and individual members of the community have sense making. So the reason why you have the arrows only going in one direction there is because. This does not influence me, I process this, I understand this. Well, so you, I was thinking of Marty's question, so you could um, imagine a scenario 20 years from now, maybe 100 years from now, yeah. where uh, you have a genuinely constructivist classroom, and that changes, right? Because it's the everyday experience that, because the children will be so curious that the everyday experience will give rise. Well, right, and then the size of the boxes will get different. Yeah, and it'll get, yeah. that way, right, the arrow will go that way. Right, there's just not, there's just not enough to, I mean, so we have to kind of start with the simplest. You know, when we started doing physics, we said, forget about wind resistance, forget about air, you know, friction and density and more and less air in different patches. Let's just talk about gravity and time. That's kind of what I'm doing here. This is the simplest, cleanest, and that's all the more data we have. Can I ask a question with regard to like teacher education? Mm -hmm. um, okay, you're, you and I are both secondary math teachers, and we're looking at this and we're saying, well, NCTM is asking us to help kids make sense of mathematics. So we see these nodes, and we know that we want to create a situation where sense-making turns out to be this gigantic thing in the center, okay? Mm -hmm. Where do you think, based on your understanding of both current teachers and situation in schools, where do you think on the dial? So, so if you want to make sense making bigger and stronger? Yeah, where do we need to focus our attention? So so I talk about uh, sense making is, is, is organization, interpretation, and representation. So we can talk about things like multiple representation, which is a hot new topic in math ed, uh, which is why we see things like the TI Inspire, which lets you have multiple representations on the same screen at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's also a matter of interpreting. So, um, not simply saying when you see the word more, it means addition. Asking kids to pro process and figure out, not just based, I just applied the most recently learned formula, but I actually have to interpret this mathematically and figure out how the operate, like that's interpretation, actually dissecting. That relates to abstraction a lot. And then there's organization. You know, how does what I'm learning now relate to other things? Going back to that classroom without walls idea. How, you know, why are algebra and geometry taught separately? Well, in a lot of situations they're not. We now have integrated mathematics. We have the spiral curriculum. And so there's more of that starting to go on. But you have to practice those tasks. So each of, the, each of these things is a verb, right? You know, intuition, you know, you, you're, you have to produce intuitions. You have to have, you have to experience them. So that's what you're doing. You just have to practice, do it more until you develop automaticity. So as a go back to us being back in the classroom again. What is it that we need to do, be aware of? As a teacher. Yeah. To, I mean, I can't just go, okay, class, I'm going to get this all over with in five minutes. You basically see this graph here. We need you to be involved more and more of these nodes, and that's it. So get involved, and I'll see you in about 180 days and well, measure and, and your progress. That's going to be, well, first of all, the, normal secondary education teacher isn't going to realize there were all these processes. Because as I said, in the normal math classroom, we only have a small slice of that, at least right now. And so just being aware that there's all these other facets that I'm, I'm missing out. OK, so there's an awareness yes. that, that, that we need to communicate. Right. And so your model could be helpful in communicating the awareness. And that they're not mutually exclusive, as it seems on the surface. Because again, when I started this whole thing, the, the Platonists and the formalists, the social culturalists versus the cognitivists, seem like they were on the opposite sides of the world. They work together. And so it's not one or the other. And, and that's kind of what the perception is. is 
well, you're either going to do the construct of this or your behaviors. Well, no. They apply in different situations to different things. And so it's, that's, the, that's the big awareness, is that it's not one or the other. Um, the other big awareness is that this is very much NCTM and very much constructivist in that if you want a student to get better at it, you have to let the student do it. Very much in the traditional classroom, the teacher prepares everything. The teacher is the mathematical thinker, as I said earlier, and then presents it pre-mathematized and says, do it. If you want the student to get good at abstraction, you have to let the student abstract. And that's, that's very hard. Because, in, especially for mathematics, we have teacher as authority as a paradigm, as a, as, a, as, a, as a social norm. And could you use this to sort of break that down just a little bit? That's sort of the idea, is that if you, this, again, this, comes, this is very much tied to my understanding of cognitive psychology. That's why they get bigger, the, the arrows get bigger over time. It works very much like neural connections. The way we understand the brain is that we develop associations over time, and literally the synapses get bigger and thicker the more you use them. And that's kind of what's going on here. And this is, we're talking about the brain of a kid. And so if you want to make the brain of a kid work better, you have to make the kid use that part of the brain so it gets bigger and thicker and stronger. Well, uh, there's really great studies out there about like taxi cab drivers in London. Uh, their spatial, the part of the brain responsible for spatial awareness gets huge in taxi drivers because they use it so much. And that's what, so that's, yes, this can very much be used to say, look, you, the teacher, need to do less in terms of math. More in the planning, yes, yes, please do more curriculum, please do more pedagogy, but far, far less in the mathematics. Um, I, I will probably restrict it to one or two, I'm looking at a time. Um, one or two questions, if, there's, if there are one or two questions from the gallery. Don't ask anything too good because it'll make us look bad. James. I have a quick question. Um, I remember being in my high school math class, and my math teacher was like, Oh my god, I love doing sine and cosine graphs. And I'm like, What is this chick talking about? And she seemed really big on the aesthetic evaluation of the mathematical world. Is there any sort of thoughts, like for me, when I think of a math person, I think of somebody who loves math because they think it's fun or they think it's cool or whatever. Is there any way, I don't know if your model speaks to this or not, but to kind of build an aesthetic evaluation as part of mathematical thinking? Uh, so first of all, the idea that math is beautiful or is fun, those are dispositions. Aesthetic evaluation is saying one piece of math is better than another piece of math. So, for example, mathematicians are very much into this thing, efficiency. So efficiency is good, is a disposition. The act of aesthetic evaluation is saying this six-step proof is more efficient than this eight-step proof. So, um, in terms of dispositions, it's, again, you, you as the teacher produce, say these are norms. Math is fun, math is beautiful. Hopefully, eventually, you'll get internalized. Or you, produce, you give them experiences where they might say, boy, that origami is really pretty. And then you say, hey, look, folding is math. And then they internalize it. That's not necessarily a social norm that you convey on them, but a piece of instruction where they've abstracted this concept of beauty that's related to math. So, um, like the tetragrams? Yeah. Like, uh, oh, yeah, like tangrams. Yeah, or yeah. tangrams, that's something. Right, right. So you, you uh, uh, use uh, fractals a lot. People are like, ooh, those are pretty, right? And that's kind of the in mathematical disposition, but it, require, it requires uh, people like Vi Hart. I don't know if you're familiar with Vi Hart. She's, she does a video series called Doodling in Math Class, oh, where, yeah. where there are no numbers. She just does things. So she talks about things like infinite sequences in series by drawing smaller and smaller elephants. And we can come to know things about math, no numbers whatsoever. And that's one way to do it. Like It's purely this visual kind of Yeah. I like the, I mean, it's, it's definitely a, you know, a level, there's a level of abstraction to the model. I, I think of the middle one as being uh, uh, really metacognition. And when Dr. Kuzma's last question, 
I was just tying back into your Obama presentation, the, the Obama video at the beginning. And I had my nephew in town over the weekend, and he loves to play Call of Duty. Mm -hmm. And you made the comment of, it seems like a lot of the thoughts on on being a mathematical thinker, like in the classroom, you could actually have no mathematical thinker. But when my nephew is playing Call of Duty, he's thinking about the everyday experiences where he's giving points. And he's thinking of, he has a mathematical disposition, he has a mathematical word, world where his, his scores are being ranked. And he has the community that's evaluating him upon that. And so there's a lot of mathematical thinking going on there. And I'm wondering how does that relate to you well, that's, that's, you got a classroom where uh, the students essentially turned off, or how does that? Yeah, that's just a completely different. It's just a different set of everyday experience, and that's taking advantage of motivation. Uh, a really big one where they do this is a game called StarCraft. This was the national game of South Korea for the longest time. I kid you not. National, like the national, like they had huge tournaments for this video game called StarCraft, and people do inordinate amounts of statistical data gathering to say it's better to do this A B C versus B A C because you, you end up doing it five seconds faster. Enormous enough. But it's based on their the motivation that I like playing this game, right? And so what's, what you're really talking about there is motivation. The kid playing Call of Duty has motivation to get his points too higher than his opponent. And that makes him do these things that require mathematical thinking. Whereas just saying, okay, Timmy, do your homework, is not nearly so motivating. So that's, that's all matters of motivation. My son tried to convince me Call of Duty was his homework. Sean's my son. Okay. You know all of you through his eyes. Uh, vividly remember uh, teaching him binary math when he was a year old. And when we sent him to you a year ago, he was just a teacher. Uh, thank you for giving us back a stall. I am astounded. With those words? Please turn off the camera. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs>